Welcome back to another episode of the React Native Radio Podcast. This is a crossover episode with React Universe on air. Mazen joins Lukash from Callstack and Quinn from Expo to talk about the retirement of App Center. Hey everyone, welcome to React Universe On Air. This is a crossover episode and I have a second host today from React Native Radio. Hello, Mazin. Hey, Lukash. Thanks for having us. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Thanks for doing this. This is the second year in a row when at the in the autumn, let's say, we record crossover episode between our podcasts and I'm really, really uh, hyped for this one, especially because this is a big one. This is a big shift in React Native community. Yeah, totally. I agree. And it's nice to kind of bring the two different podcasts together and have an episode. The React Native is all about the community and kind of bringing our two communities together is, is great. Yeah, yeah. So what are we discussing today? So we're talking about App Center's retirement and basically what to do next and how your businesses should handle them. Yeah, yeah. So this was announced this year in march i want to say they left us 12 months since march 24 till march 25 so we are around five months uh, until the cutoff date and i was browsing through uh, some different repositories here uh, code push especially and yeah they're just gonna sunset everything uh, they're not accepting any more uh, PRs, any more feature requests, they're just sunsetting it. And they basically say, get on with your lives. We are not going to support all of the features that you care about. So we've asked all of you, dear listeners, uh, on Twitter or LinkedIn, uh, what are the features that you care about from, from App Center? And we invited uh, someone that you might be familiar with from company that you are definitely familiar with. So this is Queen from Expo. Hello, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. And yeah, we basically decided, the three of us, to have a discussion. This is not an interview. This is a discussion uh, about the, not about the future of App Center. That was already decided for us. Yes. Uh, but about the, the future of our products. Like, how scared should we be? Uh, how prepared should we be for March? And what are the alternatives for what people are using? Yeah, I think before we before we go in, I think for our listeners, Quinn, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, for sure. So um, I've been working at Expo since the early days, so 2017. Um, and this is like back in the days where we all used to work in one small house in Palo Alto. Um, but before that, um, I used to work on AWS on the block storage services. Um, but now at Expo, I mostly work on the infra and server side. Um, so in particular, EAS update, which is our over the air um, update service. I make sense now why you are our special guest on the episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, spoiler alert. Uh, most of the things that you care about from App Center, you can do in Expo. And most of them and maybe all of them, you can do better in Expo. So Expo is a default a React Native framework that is recommended for, for apps to use. And it turns out that they have a lot of functionalities that can cover for App Center. So, yeah. Uh, Queen, you mentioned over-the-air updates. And this is... Uh, my assumption was before we recorded this episode, we're recording this episode, and also the mm, community feedback that we that we gather is that the most cared about feature of App Center is Code Push, which is, I think, is the it's the first React Native over the air update service. Uh, at the beginning, it wasn't a part of App Center; it was a, a standalone product company. I don't really remember. But then Microsoft bought it, uh, included it in App Center, and it was a uh, really, really loved and used. It, is, it, it still is. It still is. And I have this anecdote uh, right before uh, React Universe Conf September this year. 
I was talking with the clients of Callstack and they were asking me about like, what's up with this code send, uh, with this code push from AppCenter? We use it. A lot of our clients use it. And they said, okay, so we are writing emails to Microsoft support email that they got uh, on the AppCenter sunsetting page. And all we get, <laughs> basically all we get is, we will get back to you when we know. So in early September, the code push, um, the standalone code push didn't exist. Uh, they, I think they open source standalone code push a few weeks ago at the beginning of October or something like that. Yeah, that sounds about yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. And uh, yeah, everyone knows what code push is. Basically, you can update your app um, over the air. <laughs> Without pushing a <laughs> without pushing a store build, right? That's the important part because yes. one thing you know, as developers, our biggest, I guess, gripe with you know Apple specifically is the amount of time it takes to turn around and make a make a fix, right? So, say you have something simple where you are changing text on your screen, and you don't want to have to sit through two, three days, potentially a week of App Store updates, and sometimes you know we hate. We hate to say it, but depending on the reviewer, they find another issue with your app that you now have to go and fix. And now all of a sudden, you know, you have this typo or, you know, your app's not working as expected. So over the air update gives you the ability to just essentially change that text immediately so that you can then focus on the more, you know, higher level issues that have to go through specifically like native code. Yeah. And basically the... The native code, you can change everything that's JavaScript, yes. right? Uh, and the native code has to stay the same. So if you are interacting with some new library in your code push, in your JS bundle, you have to release new native bundles. So the native bundles are, so code push bundles are mapped to uh, native bundles, to, to native binaries. Um, so yeah, a lot of people relied on this for years uh, a lot of our clients at callstack rely on this and like so there are two parts to this so one part is you can finally have your you can have your standalone uh, code push server you can still use this or you can switch and uh, mm, and use the alternatives so Maybe let's talk first about alternatives. Maybe let's give Queen some space and let's talk about Expo updates. Yeah, so our Expo update, our EAS update is like similar st stuff to Code Push. Um, so people who are familiar with Code Push, you'll have like a deployment environment, um, like production and staging. We have a similar concept, except we call it channels, and people usually have a production and staging channel. Um, so most of the main things, like shipping your app over the air, um, we do very similar things. Um, I'd say there are a couple like main differences, um, and one of the big differences we have, um, as you said, like. Uh, Wukash, you said that like there is a JavaScript part and it has to be compatible with the native part. And one of the big things that we've always noticed is that it's really easy to push out a change where the JavaScript part is not compatible with the native part. Um, so I'd say a big thing in EAS update that we've got is something called a fingerprint policy where we get a hash of all your native updates and make sure that whenever you create a JavaScript bundle, that's actually compatible because bad things really happen when you push something that's incompatible. I think that's one major highlight to to talk about your fingerprint hashing. I'm not exactly sure. I don't think App Center or specifically Code Push does that. So that's you know that that's a good value add. So no so by going with this alternative, you're going with a different alternative plus one, right? You get a little bit more of a safety net along the lines. And then there's also something you said earlier, Lukash, about th this is the recommended framework by Meta. I think something I always mention on React Native Radio is the developer experience that Expo is putting out there, you know, based on everything that we heard from the community and internally at Infinite, at Infinite Red with our clients, is Code Push and App Center in general is very bulky and 
so many steps to use along the way, while EAS is developer built for developers and the developer experience is second to none in that concept. It's also that like you get all in one, uh, you have this great synergy uh, within Expo ecosystem, within Expo products, which uh, going to bare bones React Native project and using all of those different dependencies like Code Push uh, require you to go over like different hoops and like using different tools, different panels, different CLIs in order to achieve basically the same thing. That said, uh, many of our clients, enterprise clients at, that Costa has, we don't use Expo uh, for many reasons, right? But like for historical reasons and for like legacy reasons as well. And so we have that big setups that use code push. Uh, we have it instrumented so that we don't need fingerprint, like we know what bundles to, to yeah. handle, right? And then for those kind of clients, it might be difficult to to go over the fence and start using uh, alternatives from Expo, like Expo updates, even though for vast majority of users, it is recommended to just start using framework. Some of the enterprise users will not. Th that's just life. And then for those kind of users, you have an, it's not an alternative. <laughs> it's a lifeline uh, in uh, in. Uh, standalone code push, right? So uh, Microsoft open sourced the code push. And uh, I have some information from people at Colstack working at our own like code push wrapper solution. So right now uh, you can uh, deploy your own code push server. And this will work only on Azure from Microsoft because this was built with Azure in mind. So it's uh, very hmm, binded, let's say, uh, on the implementation level to the to the service that you're using. What we're trying to do is to have it cloud agnostic, so that you can run it on like Google Cloud and AWS and whatever you want. So that's first. We are working on that right now. Uh, the second part is I've heard that they have uh, published so the CLI, the code push CLI is a part of that um, of that repository of standalone code push and it's not um, it's not accessible through through npm so you basically have to compile it oh. and then like install it and only then you can use it locally but fun fact is you can still use that use that production cli you just have to provide it a different url for the server so that production um, cli still works we are we definitely will be working on this i'm not we already have a fork i'm not sure if it if it's published by the point uh, this episode drops or not but uh for code push to wrap up stick around if you can just migrate to expo basically uh it's a better developer experience if you are starting a new project definitely don't start with app center 100% <laughs> don't, yes don't include app center in new projects um, and if you want to have a just regular code push experience, uh, look out for uh, community support, basically. The community support will come. Uh, we are already working on it uh, as call stack. And yeah, we'll let you know how that goes. I, I also want to ask Quinn a question here, actually. So based on all that, you know, we're talking about enterprise companies. Let, let's stick with enterprise, right? If you're talking with a startup, you know, Expo recently mentioned that they're reducing their pricing and all that kind of stuff. So I think startups are all like, okay, yes, we can buy into Expo. But the enterprise folks that are out there, usually they tend to like to do this stuff, stand their own servers and all that kind of stuff, which as a developer myself, I I don't necessarily like it or see the value in it, right? And you just mentioned, Lukas, you have to bundle and create your own, like essentially create your own CLI, even though it's already there, you have to maintain it right down the line so quinn what what did, what would be your um how do i say this what would be your feedback or what, what would you say to these enterprise companies from an eas updates perspective like hey you know we have this product 
And this is why you should use it as an enterprise company instead of going down the, you know, formerly Microsoft endorsed product. Yeah. So I would say that, yeah, Wukash, um, the fact that if you guys were making a fork on the cl client and the server, um, for somebody who like has to use the code push framework, like you guys are the hero <laughs> that they need, honestly. Um, so I guess like there's uh, the way I think of it is like if you wanted to self host, um, your own update server there's kind of two ways i think about it one is to have to use the open source version of expo updates and the other one is to use the now open source version of code push so i'll speak to two of those and i'll start with the code push one um so there's the client side stuff and the server side stuff so the client side stuff i'd say the biggest amount of work that needs to be done is to make it compatible with the new React Native architecture. Um, and in, in addition, um, like as new React Native versions come out, like having somebody maintain that. Um, so like that bit's important. And for the server at Wukash, as you mentioned, um, Code Push has understandably made it with the Azure blob storage, um, which makes like a lot of sense if like your entire pipeline was on Azure to begin with, but it's not such an easy sell if your entire stack was on like GCP or AWS um, and having that uh, like storage be platform agnostic or at least like having support for the other ones like um, the Google Cloud Storage or S3 would be a big deal for people who wanted to host that server bit. Um, so for Expo updates, um, there is so also... The, maybe let me... Sorry for interrupting, but maybe yeah. let me comment on the on the two two things that you pointed out. Yeah, I I completely forgot forgot about the new architecture. I was browsing through um, code push repositories today, and there are uh, people requesting this as a feature. And like I said, Microsoft is just rejecting everything. We don't adding. We are not adding new feature to this. This will be sunset. Uh, you can fork and add it there, but there are ways of, of doing this. So basically the interop layer allows you to, to, to still use code push with uh, new architecture. I'm not sure if you, uh, need a patch, which I al also saw on that, uh, on that issue on GitHub. Someone just created a patch. It's a few lines of code. And basically they claim that it, it, it just work with this few lines of code, but definitely something that you said the community support would, will be crucial there because like you have to support the client, the CLI and the server. So that those are like three standalone packages that needs to work uh, alongside each other and like they need to be maintained. Someone has to take that on. I'm not sure if, it, if it's us. I know that we are doing some experiments, but uh, I'm not in the position. No one told me that we'll be supporting it um forever and like this will be uh, our package all of the sudden i don't know um uh, yeah and thank you for mentioning that you can run a eas update locally as well you can have a standalone yeah. version of it we had um comment on x about this actually like how do you the question was what do you use from app center how do you prepare for migration where are you migrating to and someone said we don't use App Center. <laughs> we rely on Expo, and we are thinking about uh, putting together a standalone um, Expo updates instance. So, please, sorry for interrupting. Let us know how that's how we can set that up. Yeah. So, it's an open source spec um, that the client, or well, our Expo updates package client is implemented from as well as the EAS update server. So it's like open source and you can take a look at it, but basically it's a spec that outlines, okay, like when the client makes a request for the newest update, here are the headers that have to be present. And when the server responds, like here are the he headers that have to be present as well as like the different like HTTP response codes and everything. Um, so the Expo updates client is an implementation of that. Um, and the EES update server is implementation of that, like of that spec. So 
in theory, as long as you have a compliant server, um, e-expo updates would work. Um, so what we've done is that we've also have like a GitHub repository for a compliant bare bones service. Um, so like people can fork that repo and make their own compliant server. Um, and I'll, some people have done that. Um, and yeah, so like as long as it conforms with the spec, you should be fine. Um, we do maintain the client um, like for the n- new architecture and as well as like continuing moving forward with, with like future React Native versions. Um, so like as long as you maintain your own server, I think you should be fine. That is such a big thing as well. The um, compatibility with with um, all the new React Native versions because Expo is uh, always like on top of the game, right? Like uh, if the new React Native comes out, you guys are like two months uh, two months forward. You are like compatible with the newest React Native, and it's it might be hard. Uh, for this kind of um, support uh, in in open source, basically. Well, let's also keep in mind, App Center, even though, you know, we're React Native focused, App Center is not just React Native. You know, it's also iOS, Android, you know, Swift, Kotlin, Objective-C, Xamarin, yeah, Ionic. Windows. I always forget that, right? I always think it's a React Native product because we're always using it, right? <laughs> yes. So speaking of like community support, we don't know what would happen with it if when it becomes fully open source, right? This um I mentioned the story to you both earlier, but I'll you know mention it on air. For listeners, if you've heard of the product Parse before, Parse was a really good uh I believe it was MongoDB with like um it was like serverless server functions. I don't remember, it's been a while since I've used it, but it was like a one in one product to have your backend API requests and a database all in one. And for startups, it was a great tool. It was like your, you know, what you call now Supabase and Firebase type uh, type of stuff. And it did it all for you. Startups loved it. Facebook bought it. Everyone was like, oh, perfect. Now, you know, it was Facebook then. Facebook is going to maintain it and take care of it. Well, Facebook sunsetted it, opened a fork and had it open source and released it to the public to maintain and just walked away from it. Now, at least App Center is giving you they gave us like close to a year, right? They, Facebook at that time did not. I think it was a quick turnaround. And as startups, people were left hanging to dry. And I remember trying to like set it up on, um, what do you call it, on Amazon. And it took a while for a small startup to do it. And eventually we did it and we were using it. But at the end of the day, it just, it seemed like a lot for a smaller company to have to maintain. Enterprise, sure. But kind of like the point I'm getting at is with App Center, it's not just React Native. There's a potentially a larger community out there to maintain it, but keeping in mind, if you're having Xamarin developers, I, you know, native developers maintaining it for their cause, will the React Native aspects of it fall behind? And at that point, reaching for an alternative like EAS is a better solution because they are React Native specific, right? Yeah, but the code push was React Native specific. Initially, right? And then they eventually opened it up to others, as far as I remember. I could be wrong. I I don't I don't think so. Like no? in just okay. in, in just native world, it, it doesn't make sense to have JavaScript bundle. Yeah, but I think you can push other stuff. Hmm. Maybe. Maybe yeah, I'm not <laughs> exactly is, sure. This I'm is not, not really well well researched that yeah, <laughs> It was something I was just literally thinking of right now as as Quinn was talking. I mean, yeah, if it's about interpreted, if it's interpreted code, in it theory, could it could be used right. for the air updates. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome, everyone, to the two best React Native shows on the planet. <laughs> there uh, you go. But yeah, like, so when I read through Microsoft Docs on App Center and how they, how they tell you to migrate, they are steering you towards the tools that are more that that are much more powerful usually from microsoft umbrella from azure pipelines and all of that um but what what i see between the lines there is app center is such a specific use case 
and Expo is uh, is even more specific because it's only for React Native. But App Center, in terms of like build functionality, it could build only uh, mobile applications. They are steering you towards the systems they can that can build the web applications for you and like mobile application and and all of that. Uh, also, like from from perspective of all of the features, they are steering you towards those more powerful tools like that that can be embedded in like multi-platform products and not only towards mobile products. So I think that's a that's something that might have impacted the uh, the decision there. Why are we supporting this mobile only tool chain if we have so many other products that support that mobile spectrum but only uh, but also support like wider spectrum of like different app categories basically. So how about we move on uh with our walkthrough uh, walk through through app center uh so we talked about code push this is definitely the, the biggest one so what were uh, i'm looking at my notes here what were the the second most important issue there for our um listeners i believe it was build related yeah i think build and then um releasing distributing yeah distributing yeah was like two uh, second place exactly exactly so let's let's go through build right so yeah i think build uh when i look again when i looked at documentation from app center was not free actually uh on microsoft like you had you had to pay for that and you had some machine power like um, mac os's somewhere in microsoft cloud that allowed you to to build it and i guess if you are in this um in this ecosystem of app center you already use code push you might uh just as well just just use build it 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 was simple to use uh it did the job uh what are the alternatives for that should we start with eas yeah sure yeah yeah so to recap um what you said like to my knowledge code push was free and Yes, or not? Yes, um, apps, app center build, um, like they probably did have a freemium model, but because yeah, like the Mac runners, um, are very expensive, uh, it makes sense to be charging for that. Um, so the alternative that we have is EAS build. Like a lot of people are probably familiar with that when you run like the build command in your project directory and you're taken to a website, uh, where it shows you like all the build steps, um that go into creating like your expo app or your expo binary. Um, I'd say late last year though, we've made it more flexible so that it works not just for a React Native app without expo framework, but like in theory also just like plain native builds. So like all the build steps are specified now in the YAML. Um, and like even for somebody who was just using a plain native app like in theory you could just like remove all the react native all the expo steps and if your app can be specified in a gem file and and honestly you can run like any arbitrary command like you could build um your app on our servers it's got we've got like yeah, what about the uh, what about the expo key in packet json do you do you still have to have that so we do have configurations where we do rely on yeah like certain like configuration files so that we're like okay like this is your project this is your account this is like how it relates to build so like yes like you would have to have like a i guess a project id or like an i guess what you you refer to as like the expo key so that we can keep track of those configurations i think the the big benefit for for something like expo build is that you can run it in the cloud and like you don't have to correct me if I'm wrong, but I I don't think I am. <laughs> you don't even have to have a Mac machine in or, in order to just create for iOS, right? You you can you can build in the cloud and you can submit to the stars and you can just work on Linux or something. I know we have I believe yeah, we have a true. client. I'm trying to remember. We have a client that 
allows their developers to work on other machines like Windows or and Linux, like you mentioned. But what they'll do is they'll kick off the job to do the build on the EAS server, download, and then use it that way within their um, simulator and code. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, to build an iOS app or like to for the iOS platform, like you have to have a Mac machine. There's no ways around it. And like for people who have like Windows machines, like you you can't really run Xcode build or whatever. So in that case, it does make sense to run it in the cloud. But if you have a Mac machine, like everything's open source. So there's no reason why you couldn't like pass it in the local flag and have it run on your machine locally as well. Um. So yeah, like the alternative for building, I'm not sure how many people actually build on build on app center when i ask um among our team leads for our clients and our clients like seems like no one from our client was using this particular functionality even though we heavily rely on code push and like what we basically do is just we use a uh, custom configuration on pipelines like we yeah we we just build it ourselves in the in the cloud infrastructure. So it was the same for us. I think code push was actually I think the only feature from App Center that was used on any of our clients in the past. And like you said, for build, we built our own dependent on, you know, clients' needs and, you know, whatever contract they may have had. There's other products like you could use Fastlane, actually, which I believe ES build is um on top built on top of. There's other CI CD tools that do building for you, right? There's Bitrise, there's Tramline, there's Code Magic. Um, there's a bunch of different tools out there. I'm sure if you were to Google it, they a bunch would pop up. But those are the you know the like four or five that are coming to the top of my mind right now. Yeah, Fastlane is is such a versatile tool. Like yeah. it's a dependency for all of those others, probably. But also like you can use it standalone. Like you can you can do very magical thing with with uh, with Fastlane. And I will say Fastlane is one of those things that is less painful running in CI CD rather than having everybody like distribute Fastlane on their own machine and running it because it's written in Ruby and I feel like Ruby is notoriously hard to get uniformly installed on everybody's machine. Um we've had a lot of pain points with it. So I feel like it's just one of those things that's just if you have the environment in CI CD to do it, just like run fast lane on CI CD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I remember when I was writing some plugins for that. Like you have to have this uh, gems and RBV, like version manager for Ruby as well. <laughs> yeah, the, I think it's RBM. RVM. Yeah, yeah. yeah something, something like that. that yeah. RBNV or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so for, for building, building is also like not that, uh, hmm. I want to say not that needed from the service because like you can build locally and you can update locally. Uh, you can just uh, create builds locally and just distribute. But distributing is a bigger thing, I think. Like distributing is such a... Um, Mm -mm -mm. crucial part of like the whole product lifecycle workflow like distributing internally to developers is distributing locally to your own QAs and then distributing to beta testers and then to production like there are a bunch of different steps and I didn't use <laughs> distribute from App Center as well so, uh, yeah, maybe I will give voice to Queen again to explain us how how this system can work. Wh why is distributing such an important part? Yeah, okay. So when we say app distribution, like in the context that you say, I take it to mean like how do we get our apps like to people outside of Google Play? Like before you submit it to Test Track, how do I get it to people outside of of the app store before I submit it to test flight. Um, and so like we usually call that like internal distribution and under the hood, like whatever product you're using, it could be app center. Um, it could be us, but for Android, it's fairly straightforward to do that. Um, but for 
iOS, um, there's like a lot of code signing that goes on behind the scenes. So um, in terms of that, like what you need to do is you have to register people's devices and you have to put it on something called an ad hoc profile. And what a lot of these services will do is that once they've built your app with that credential, um, they'll expose a QR code. Um, and it'll basically, it's it's really weird. It's called the iTunes Music Store Protocol. So instead of HTTP or HTTPS, like it's this like ITMS protocol. But basically you scan that QR code on your phone um, and it will download that app like outside of the app store or test flight. Um, so we do have um, tooling to for many years now, actually, um, to make that very seamless, to, like to register your dev- device and to build those credentials and to expose that QR code. Um, we do have that um, like in our command line tools. Um, and I I suspect that's probably how App Center did it as well. Their app distribution or like anybody that uses that QR code, it's like that mechanism. Well, I don't know about the um, App Center. Like I said, I, I haven't used this feature, but we've been using Firebase extensively, like Firebase distribution. And yeah, like this is basically the same thing. You have to register devices. Uh, you have to accept invite. Maybe you, you even have to like go through setting to like accept some profile or something. Two things. You have to accept the profile management that Firebase, so Firebase specifically, what they give you. You also need to make sure developer mode is on. I believe that was as of a more recent iOS version. Um, I, I don't remember what version that was, but it was more recent in that sense. So those are like the two things. Oh, and you provide your UDID if you were doing it the manual way rather than, you know, the EAS way of scanning a QR code. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, like I would propose that an alternative is definitely um, ES submit uh, for distribution and like something like Firebase. Uh, I wonder if I don't think Firebase can do store uploads for you you can do it do it via fast lane obviously but i'm not i'm not sure if you can do it via firebase probably not probably, probably not. not yeah i don't think so yeah anything else to to add to like distributing um bundles and i guess there's like automated submission to the store which is i guess also app distribution but it's not internal um and i'm sure like app center also had auto automation for that um which we also do as well so like when i think about it it's just like internal app distribution and then there's like the external one which like both workflows are all automated but in my mind they're just different yeah and so like uh, i want to recap what we went through to this point so first we talked about code push and alternatives there's only one Uh, there are two standalone code push and then um, uh, ES update. Then we talked about building and distributing, which are also services that EAS support. And now I want to go to something that very few people actually mentioned in the LinkedIn posts and in Twitter X posts, which is testing, also one of the service from App Center. And then diagnostic and analytics, which is, again, uh, one of the least popular. Um, Let's start with testing. So are there any uh, alternatives on the Expo site for testing? Yeah. So late last year, we... We, we had the ability so that you could specify all your build steps in a YAML, and we've extended that to include tests. So like support for Maestro tests. Um, and if you want to run it um, like with a simulator, um, like it, it can be specified. Um, if you're talking about real devices, um, like something like AWS Device Farm, like we, we don't have that in the context of CI, CD. Um, but we do have that in terms of like a development build where we have easy ways to get it on your real device for testing. 
Yeah, I guess I guess in the app center uh, way of things, it's about those real devices. It's about those device farms, and the, I think the one of the mm, services they propose as an alternative is browser stack, which has a has it in its name, right? Like you can run all of the tests on like different devices on different browsers, and yeah, this is something that I've seen on on my clients projects that we use browser stack extensively but it's not like it's under one roof right it's not like we can do um as in app centers a uh, way of doing things you have just one admin panel and you do all of the things there like for browser stack you have to like upload the bundle to them uh run some scripts and then get the results to your pipelines so I guess probably you could do something similar with Expo and with the pipelines that you run there as well, right? Yeah. So we're actually releasing this in very shortly, but it's something called workflows, where it's like the pipelines you describe, um, where you can just run. Like we have these like jobs that like, say, for example, if you want to register your device automatically or do testing or build, like you can specify them all in a YAML. Um, and then like chain them together, um, like have the build run, then the test run, and then like chain it to automatically submit to the store. Um, but just, yeah, like just automatic jobs that can be customizable is something that we are releasing really soon. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thanks for, uh, giving us a peek, uh, behind the curtain there. Uh, yeah, but I, I, I guess, like I said, um, App Center was such a narrow uh tool and they are expanding to just in just integrate with those bigger tools and like you you do the same thing right like you you expand to to be able to integrate with mm, external services as well i've been personally starting to see a lot of shift when it comes to testing in qa doing a lot of manual as opposed to using tools like these device farms doing a lot of manual testing where you know a qa team will purchase it gets expensive over time right purchase like their top three to five for each uh, platform like the devices that are being used and manually go through all those those tests and you know stuff like maestro could come valuable running using you know installing the app and then running a maestro yaml file like so like you mentioned quinn the workflows concept but that seems to be a lot more seems to be growing more in popularity these days and we're starting to see that with some of our clients too I see. I see it differently. Actually, yeah. I cannot. I, I don't agree with this. Uh, on our end, like it's all about shifting left and all about automating as much as possible. Like we still have a lot of manual QAing. Don't get me wrong, but yeah, uh, we want to make sure. And like those device farms, it's not like we want to run on hundreds of different device categories. Uh, like the different devices, different models, but it's it's used to have that uh, so that you can. Oh, do you? <laughs> this will be a tangent. We have foldable devices now. Yeah, <laughs> and, unfortunately. Yes, and like usually, most often, more often than not, like you don't have different um, UI for those from your product side, from your like design. <laughs> And then a uh, few percent of your user base will have those kind of devices for some products. And then you get bugs on them. So like something like browser stack comes really handy then. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like, you know, going back on my point, like I see the value with the manual testing for those specific devices. But like you mentioned, the smaller percentage of the foldable, the other devices, it's always great you know, to push them onto a device farm get those statistics from that and decisions. But for the higher end ones that are being used, you know, 50% maybe, I don't know what that percentage is, a high number, right? You would probably say 25% or more if that device, you might want an, an additional manual QA test on there to validate the experience, right? There's a lot of stuff that automation cannot pick up on that is always valuable to have in, a, in someone's hand to validate the um, user experience on. 
And that's kind of where, I, where my point was coming out. A lot of the clients want that as they're focusing more on the user experience aspects of their app. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, and it sounds like you need both like automated device farms to get those like really edge case models that Wukash is talking about, but also like sanity check to be like, does my app work in the most basic sense? And you don't really want someone to be testing that every single time. But exactly. also the the more advanced QA steps definitely need to be done by humans. And like this is a great segue to the last section that we want to talk about, which is uh, diagnostic and analytics. Uh, which is that last step, which is the step that you want to have some kind of instrumentation so that you know how your app behaves at the um, end user experience. W what's the end user experience like? Uh, I to 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 to, to lean, on, lean on your point. I saw a big shift uh, recently uh, in our products, uh, a big focus on observability on instrumenting the code so that things that we don't that you can't even notice when you manually or automatically QAing the app just spring out in your user hands. So when someone is using the app for two, three hours, maybe you will have some memory leak or something like that. It's really hard to find just doing the basic testing. Or like different work for different devices, different like user paths can lead to unexpected bugs, which we, you you will just not mm, automate for it or, or or like create test scenarios for. So it is a big topic for me right now personally because I do that in my project, and yeah, you could do that with app center tooling. And something that they point to as an alternative is Datadog. And I've been using Datadog for, for some time now. And let me tell you, like, this is a, oof, it's a huge machine. Like, what you can do in this tool is mind-blowing. Uh, you can integrate metrics from, like, different, um, different points in your whole system, not only from your mobile app, but, like, combine um mobile and web and and backend into like one observability panel which when i first got to doing this was mind blowing for me and i'm not sure how robust app centers um solution was but on grounds like that in order to stay competitive in order to bring a lot of value for clients like this cannot be your mm, like second job almost yeah. it has to be your first priority and like this is this is what things like data uh, data doc or i think data bricks gives you like those specific observability tooling gives you what are even, your thoughts on this? Even Sentry, right? Sentry has yeah, a Sentry, dedicated for React Native team. Christoph Waldrich was on React Native Radio with Robin, I believe. And they basically went over that they have a whole dedicated team just for React Native. And that's their full focus. So that's that's also a great, great aspect of it. Like, I'd say the best integration with React Native I've seen is actually Sentry. So... We've worked with them actually for a couple of years, um, like Christoph Woldrich. Um, and yeah, like the way that they've gone about like setting it up for React Native and they've got the system called debug IDs, um, like it's really solid. So I'd say the two key things um, when I look at like whether something is well integrated with React Native is like, how are they uploading the source maps for like when you build the bundle, but also something that's often overlooked is for over the air updates because you need that source map and a lot of times it's overlooked. Um, but yeah, like the Sentry team has done a really good job of integrating that and making that super painless. Um, I'd say I've also had experience with Datadog, not for mobile, but I will say, Wukash, to your point, like Datadog does some crazy metrics aggregation. Like you can see like 
like the histograms and like everything. We use it for our servers. Um, I can't really speak to it for mobile, but yeah, Datadog has some crazy instrumentations as well. It, it, yeah, I, I didn't mention Sentry because it's been a while since I worked with it. I I just work with whatever is actually on my client's stack right now, and yeah. this is on what's my on what's my client stack right now. But yeah, I remember working with Sentry, and and it, it's great. Like it's a it's one of the go to solutions specifically for React Native. Uh, yeah, there are a bunch of other uh, toolings as well. Uh, my point is. This has to be your business in order to for it to be like good and well maintained. Yeah. Okay. I guess we went over. Did we forget something? Uh, I don't think so. No, I like, think we're good. I think we got it all. Yeah. So for wrap up, um, we've talked. We started this episode saying how scared should you should you be, uh, because App Center is is going to be that soon uh for some of the tools you shouldn't be that scared like for for code push specifically like you you would be able to use your existing integration with just standalone server or you can easily i would say i looked at the docs easily migrate to uh to expo updates for some of the things that you've actually spent time instrumenting your app for things like, yeah, let's say diagnostics, right? For like things uh, that have specific APIs. Uh, you don't need me saying this. You are probably already migrating to something else, to something more robust. Because like if you have a lot of instrumentation, like you have to rewrite uh, some of it. Uh, what would you guys say for build and distribute for, for like pipelines and, and all of those kind of like workflows? I'm a little bit biased because we're coming out with that. So um, I, I would definitely <laughs> say us, but I will leave that to you guys. No, I, I mean, like, I'm not saying what should people migrate to. I'm saying when should they start migrating? Like how they should think about migration? I'd say in general, as I, I've done a couple of migrations myself, the sooner the better, because I feel like not everything is one-to-one like the closest one-to-one services i've seen is maybe like gcs and s3 but i feel like everything else like there's always quirks of a different product that you don't really foresee or if you're using like a really niche case that isn't really supported in the other platform like you find that out when you migrate and if you do it too late you might not have enough time um which is yeah, like especially with hard deadlines, it's it's a thing. So doing it early is better. Um, so you can find out the issues before. I, I totally agree with Quinn. I think if at this point you're not at least researching the alternatives out there, right, and making your decision, right? If and if you're an enterprise company, you probably need to be in contract negotiations with Sentry, Datadog, all these other products that we've talked about, right? If you're not at least at that stage right now, I think you're a little bit behind because the last thing you need is Microsoft to press that shutdown button and all of a sudden, you know, everything is broken and you can't push anything to your stores. You can't access your analytics, your your devices, your testing devices. So start researching at least and hopefully, you know, come January, you know, first PR is up for starting to migrate away to all this stuff. We mentioned a lot of good products out there that, you know, I shouldn't be new to most people in the React Native yeah. ecosystem. And Martin, you know what? Like, if someone is already behind, they can, like, look at Infinite Red or Callstack. Absolutely. Uh, both of these companies are really well-versed in helping you out. So reach out to us. And, yeah, we can help you out migrate from App Center to whatever tooling is best for you like exactly expo will probably be best for most of the products but there are edge cases there that we can help you navigate this is, would not be the first migration we've had to do for both companies so you're yeah. absolutely right there lukash uh yeah uh Martin, i think our uh crossover episode is ending right now <laughs> i want to thank you so much for doing this with me 
Yeah. Uh, thank Thanks you, for Queen, having me. for being a guest. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, see you soon on both feeds, React Native Radio and uh, React Universe Honor. As always, thanks to our editor, Todd Wirth, our assistant editor, Jed Bartoski, our marketing and episode release coordinator, Justin Husky, and our guest coordinator, Mazen Chami. Our producers and hosts are Jamin Holmgren, Robin Hines, and Mazen Chami. Thanks to our sponsor, Infinite Red. Check us out at infinite.red slash radio. A special thanks to all of you listening today. Make sure to subscribe to React Native Radio on all the major podcasting platforms.